body of some heroes, our fathers. Many times I choose to call my man. When I emerge like a chief breaking out of mother's wings, there were arms ready to receive me. There were hearts prepared to love me. But there was a man tending mommy and me, hovering over our heads like a little sweet, calling, marking territory, keeping us off dangerous reach. His eyes were fierce and his jaw set. His chin was chiseled in strong firmness, but his hands held mine in a simple promise to love and to hold and to teach and lead, to be my support and provider of needs, to be my barmy as long as he lives. I remember when I barged into the room at 2 a.m. because I saw Ojuju, teeny tiny feet, pretty rounded eyes. I looked to the ones whose love is true. Mama's arms were ready to pick me. But Papa's arms were the ones who assured me as I rested in the nook of muscle and flesh tainted by sweat. His sweat. The one in daily shares to provide our daily bread. Bami, you are my mirror. You show me life in all reflections. You guide my path with your instructions. You gave me Jesus, the right foundation. You taught me worship. Service, love, the right formation. You tended my words and picked me when I'm falling. You said when I'm down, I better start crawling. You got me on my feet and stood behind me. You showed me love and how men should treat me. You didn't just give growth, you gave the covering. You got on your knees, we saw you pray. Now I'm 20 something and adulting. Adulthood has come. I've joined in singing, but you, you shoulder the responsibilities without grumbling. You are the hotspot we keep connected. While we were eating Papa's purse, he was busy loving us. He would empty himself to pour out into us. Now when this purse is empty, he would fend for us. Papa would make sure we are fine, though sometimes it's not. Bami, you have your dreams, but in a heartbeat you will leave it all for my team. When it comes to picking between those projects and me, you see my needs and run to me. You walk hard behind the scenes, providing the means to give our aspirations wings. Sure. One, two, three, four. I've lost count of my Christmas clothes, but you do not mind repeating the shirt so you can afford school fees. You deserve all the accolades today by all means. But by me, do you get to me? I missed your world of strength. Does it get tiring? When you need help, do you tell somebody? Instead of sucking it in, do you share it? We see how you work for this family. How 
how you never fail to get on your feet. Many times we forget your needs and assume your feet. Feet to meet every need without the feet. But by we see how sometimes you slouch below the weight and then brush it off with just the wave. My father, like many men, feel to share his pain and struggle. Society forced them to be tough, so they enclosed their emotions in the bottle. Mm. But we owe our men the duty to teach them to hold the up and share. Yes. For sometimes he also needs someone to allay his fears. Being a father is an opportunity precious like them. A chance to make the world a better place through a little boy like them. And someone once said, Inheritance is what you need for your kids. But legacy is what you need in your kids. So to my father, who took his time to build the right legacy in me and all similar dads out there, happy Father's Day. Amen, that's beautiful, eh? You know, extreme sincerity. If we can be honest with one another this morning, especially as dads, we can ask ourselves if as dads we are connected to the heart of the Father. In the life that we're living in now in the society, that we live in now, dads have become a extinct race. Fathers have become extinct to some degree. But if I've taught you anything, ladies and children, it is that there is always a source and that there is always a root. And let me tell you something, Fathers are not merely giving up. Fathers have been forced to give up. Fathers have been stripped of their rights in families, in the church, and in business. Now fathers are acting almost more like mothers, isn't it? Fathers have lost their identity because before you find a father, Pastor Stephen, you must first find a man. You see, God is very really interested in making the man. That's why with the kids and the youth, we spend a lot of time in forming and shaping their identity. Because some of you might be unaware of this, but as pastors, we deal with men, 30-something, 40-something, 50-something, 60-something years old, that are broken, and never ever had a proper identity. Never, never mind being a father. Let me tell you something. To sow a sperm and to fertilize an egg doesn't make us a father. Maybe a just a title. But a father walks a road, isn't it? Now we can sit and we can feel sorry for ourselves, or we can do something about it. But only when we do something about it, we will see a change in this generation. Some of you seated here no longer have your fathers because they have passed on to another life. But if you are seated here and you are alive today, then it will start with us. I am a father. I became a father two years ago. If I can be very honest with you, even though I was very excited when I met my wife, and you guys know all about this excitement now. I was very excited when I met my wife. And because I had asked the Lord for my daughter by her name, when I received her, he understand that even for a father and a daughter, there's also some kind of honeymoon experience. Eh? 
Yeah, I'm going to look at you guys. So. They, they're about to get married or they, they got engaged. You can give them a hallelujah. other people in the body, hallelujah. That's the body. The body concerns itself for the body, not for itself. And so, but then life had to happen. Life had to happen. Isn't that right? You get away from the honeymoon experience and now you start living together and life has to happen. You come into your first fight. Has anybody been there? Hey, or you all angels? Okay, I see. I see a species tell you who and I was like, fight? I don't know anything about fighting in marriage. There's no such thing, man. Hey? Fighting as a father, hey? Pastor Stephen? No, 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 there's no such thing, eh? That is these children, let me tell you. They are angels. Okay. They are just vicious little monsters. I mean, awesome angels. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm joking, I'm joking, family. But the reality is life happens. And as life is happening, this is what I like about children. You see, children don't observe you when you're the pastor of a church. They don't sit there and observe what you're saying here. They wait for you to get home. They wait for you <laughs> to fix the pool. And while you're fixing the pool, it doesn't work. Try once, try twice, try a third time and lose your temper and feel like closing the pool with some mud. Are you there? Amen. And children observe that. See, they're not so much interested in what we say, and even though what we say is extremely important because it will form them. But they observe. And you and I have become, to some degree, a product of what we have observed in our lives. Isn't that so? We all had a mother or a father at a point. Then some of us got a stepdad or a stepmother added to the mix. Are you there? Whatever the case might be. And who we are today was formed by what we have observed for a minimum of at least 18 years. Are you, are you with me? So very often I, I sit with parents, I'm just chatting by the way. Very often I sit with parents and the parents say, listen, maybe it might be a stepdad, might be a stepmom, might be a mom or a dad. They say, now oh, my, my son or my daughter has become a teenager. I just don't know what to do with him. I cannot believe where he gets this character and this personality from. And I look at them and they're like, are you sure you don't know? Is he stubborn? No, he's very stubborn. Oh. Is he rebellious? Yeah, he's very rebellious. Does he kick against the pricks? Yes, he's a prick. I mean, he kicks against the pricks. Oh, uh, again, all angels, that's fine. Uh, I saw that, you know, you look when I said prick, you look at uh, Jason, uh, uh, Jane, uh, I saw that, I saw it. I'm joking, Jane, she loves you, okay? You don't have to talk for that one, right? Just reveal the other spot that is, okay? So now, whatever you want today, just quit. Okay, new PlayStation, whatever, okay? okay? But guys, they observe. So I want to ask you something. If children observe us as fathers, then what do you think you and I do when it comes to God? Have you realized that much of your faith walk is about your observations? What you see by the natural, you often believe. What I don't see by the spiritual often causes disbelief or unbelief. But what if we, from the purity of our hearts, could see and understand the character and the nature of our God? Can we see? 
Anybody? Okay. Not specifically. But we encounter his attributes, isn't it? We encounter his characteristics. And in the same way that we have become to some degree, that again, I realize that many people here have already received deliverance from that. We deal with people all the time who had an absent father, who had an absent mother. Those people need to actually come into the realm of deliverance. They need to be set free of certain patterns and certain things over their lives. If that is true for them, then what is true for us? How do we observe our benevolent father? Well, how do we? Just check your prayer life. The boldness of your prayers will indicate if you know or do not know the love of the Father. Are you with me? Surely a child who knows and who understands who his parents are will know how to approach his or her parents. Isn't that true? Kiara, surely you know which things you can approach Linda with, and you also know which things you shouldn't even approach her with. Is that correct? Is that a surprise to you? Okay. <laughs> Chandra, you know. Oh, Chandra, I can see it. I feel it going and going in the atmosphere. <laughs> Chandra, you know exactly the type of thing that you can ask your mom, isn't it? But Chandra, I want to guess that you probably even know what day not to ask. Am I right? You see the way she puts down the handbag. May prove the way she puts down the handbag, you know. Uh oh, over. <laughs> isn't that right? <laughs> And have you ever sat and studied her? Have you sat with a pen and parchment and, and studied her? I know my mom is like this. No, you don't do that. You observed. Am I right? I'm trying to drive through that. And that was an inner joke. I don't know if you want to reveal it to the rest of the body. She actually also stayed with the pen and How is it? And she does that as well. Mom, different strokes for different numbers. Amen. Okay. It's observation. Do we know that faith allows us to see? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So can you see God? Yes. Absolutely. You can see miracles happening in front of your eyes. You can see life happening in front of you. All of creation. And all of these things are putting who he is on the spot. Hello. It's a very simple message. But if it's putting God on the spot, you know that the word of God says that the beer in the heart will see God. Wow. Actually see the manifested presence of God. And yet, in our prayer life, can I be bold with you this morning? Can I say to us all that in the realm of our prayer life, it does not sound like we know Him. In fact, very often, guys, and I will put my hand up first to say that I recognize still in my life the patterns of religion coming up in the sound of my prayer. And these religious prayers are witnessing against me. You see, these prayers are not going to heaven. And so very often I sit with people who say to me, they pray and they pray and they pray, and nothing changes. And I look at them and I want to go, no, but you're not praying. You're speaking. You're making a sound and you're rambling on about the same thing every day, but not in any one of those days are we connecting to a benevolent father. 
I don't know. Can you imagine, Frankie, that when you marry this chick next to you, right? Which I'm still not convinced. I don't know how she did it, but I think she got you drunk. Okay, that's just what it is. But I think, all right. I'm not sure. I'll just, the truth will come out, Jaden. Okay? The truth will come out. I don't know how she convinced him, but the truth will come out. Okay. When you eventually get married, and you guys wake up to one another every morning, which you will, okay? God willing, if you don't store it to get you put you out into another room, I don't know. Okay. And you wake up next to her every morning, and imagine that Kiara greets you for the next 50 years in the exact same way. Imagine that you, when you get off the bed, Kihara is in the kitchen wearing the same clothes, the same slippers, preparing the same breakfast day in and day out. Can I be honest? Can you be honest? That's me. But it won't happen in 50 years. Yeah. Can you imagine 30 years? But I cannot even imagine three weeks. And yet, our prayer life has sound the same since the moment we gave our lives to Jesus. And it's still sounding the same right now. And it hasn't changed. And it's evidence that I don't know. Are you with me? Fathers need to be known. Surely his Christmas son goes to him. Christmas son knows exactly where his father is at. Are you with me? He knows what to ask. He knows what he cannot ask. He knows how he thinks. He knows how he puts thoughts together. We know. If we know this of our earthly fathers and our earthly mothers, why is it that we struggle to comprehend who God is? Why is it that our prayers, our worship, so quickly become religious Yet we just heard him say, it will never happen. Because we realize that if we treat each other that way, it becomes mundane and dead. And I want to tell you something, my friend, and my family member. Dead prayers don't reach heaven. I I can prove it with the word. Dead prayers don't reach heaven. The Israelites were in the mountain, the desert, going around the mountain for how many years? 40 years. Why would I worship a God to only connect with him religiously and not to connect with him as a father? It doesn't quite make sense, does it? That's why the enemy comes and tells you, Apostle Stephen, we've been praying for this, we've been praying for this, we've been praying, but nothing is happening, Apostle Stephen. And you need to listen to that voice of the enemy, not to take what he says, but to listen to what he's really saying. Because the enemy, I told you a while ago, opposition is your prophetic partner. The enemy will confirm to you the areas that you are at amiss. The enemy will also confirm to you the areas where you are hitting the mark. Just look at what he's saying. Just look at what he's pointing to. Are you with me? The reason that fathers are missing in our society is because those fathers never connected to a father. They connected to an idea of religion. And in that religion, they never got an answer. And I don't blame them for walking away. Because religion doesn't offer an answer. Religion doesn't bring a solution. I'm saying this for a reason. Some of you are maybe thinking, why am I talking about this? It's because this is what makes a man. Connecting to a father is what makes and establishes a man. I can prove it in society that more than 75%, more than, 
by much more than the people that are in jail currently, men and women alike, they have the same parental structure at home. You want to know what it is? There's no father. And then some fathers are there, but they're not connecting to a heavenly father. And so they cannot instill identity. Yes, they can teach their children about the world. Yes, they can warn their children about the world. Are you with me? But they cannot instill identity. A mother will reaffirm. A mother will comfort. But it does not come naturally to a mother to import identity. It's the father that establishes identity. And many of us sitting here don't have fathers, we had an absent father, and that's not a hoo-ha or a reason to cry. We have a heavenly father. That's who we connect to, and that's who we find identity in. Do you know that the father has given you his word for you to speak it, for you to pray it, for you to proclaim it, for you to become it, who is it? It is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. And Jesus' name and His Word is even above the Word of God. And that's why religion doesn't take you there. Because religion takes you to the idea, but it doesn't connect you to the person. Many of our family boys and girls, we are praying, we are praying, I feel like giving up, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that, I say, where's the word? They can't give the word. They don't have a word. They don't have identity. A father without the word of God is not a father that can give identity. Because you cannot give what you do not have. Are you with me? So it's a good time for us family, as the remnant, as the church, to go and re-analyze what is this all about. We can pray pray spontaneously, but we need the backing of the word so that those prayers can carry power. It's a problem if we're sitting in the church for seven years. And the only scripture we can still recall is that John 3, 16, 1. Are you with me? For God so loved the world. Yes, thank you very much. We all know that. What does that change in your life? Nothing. Are you there? It hasn't brought change. And then just to quote it is not the power. To live it is the power. So people keep asking me, what's going on in the ministry? Oh, I don't know what's going on in the ministry. Not my ministry. I just do it. What's going on in business? I don't know what's going on in business. It's not my business. I'm just doing it. But if I connect it to the right source, will it not provide for me according to the word? Are you with me? For your children. Parents, for your children. Today is Father's Day. Take this for your children. Some mothers and fathers, not anybody here I trust, are so consumed with themselves that their children are perishing at the door dying at the door and life is all about them because they haven't become a father they haven't become a person that can give identity they haven't become a person that can instill the word of God and prophesy over their children and lay hands on their children and move in power in signs and in wonders because they are under the word Hello. That God's word calls our children a legacy, a blessing, Hello. and life. That our children carry the testimony and the legacy of who we are. Hello. God is a God. God is a father of generations of Abraham and Isaac. And Jacob. If you find our God, and our God cannot prove to you and show to you that He is both a father and a son, then you have never touched God in your life. Are you with me? 
men, fathers, we need to get the backbone of Jesus back in our lives. We cannot quiver and cower and cry over everything that happens. We need to carry the yoke of His anointing on my shoulders and it doesn't matter what it takes. We need to get up and we need to go with Jesus because you're not doing this in your power and stop believing that you are. Because Satan wants to keep you trapped there. Your power, your defeat. No, 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 no. He's got it all wrong. It's his power and his victory to reign and to rule in this life, to take care of your children, not just financially. Some people are so rich, all they have is money. Hello. But you have a legacy, you have a wealth, you have the word of God implanted into your very being. Now, men, fathers, and parents alike, how will you lead with the word? How will you speak? How will you edify your family with the word? Hello? Do you think that our children are so dumb that they know that you're not connecting to something that is real? And you wonder why they don't want part of the inheritance of the saints and yet they see no evidence of that kingdom upon you and me? Hello? Come on now. Fathers, arise in this hour. Because if God is truly getting a remnant together, you must understand that he's no longer, no longer looking for Mr. Steve Stunning. He's looking for families. God is interested in the family unit. That we start sitting together again. Maybe they say, oh, it's not 1952. It wasn't 1952. It's called fellowship. It's called communion. It's called having your own house in order. How can a house that is disorderly run a business that is orderly? How can a house of disorder train up children that are orderly? It cannot. It cannot. Because there's a spirit behind this that is working behind the scenes. And therefore, many parents don't know what to do with their teenagers. They don't know what to do with their children. Their children are telling them, turn left here, go right there, do this, do that. And moms and dads are just submitting, submitting, submitting. To a child that doesn't even have an identity. Submitting to something that doesn't have an identity? Hello? Your children become 21. And they start giving you the truth of the word of God. Your children start coming to you. And instead of you taking your things, you actually listen to what they say because they're not wrong. They've touched Jesus and they want you to touch him too. Uh, so fathers, parents, the rise, our children, our legacy, need us to show them the real Jesus. They've seen religion, they've seen culture, they've seen the things that we get up to. They've seen us at our worst. Can we repent? Of course. Can we turn around? Of course. But you know what we testify to them? When we're going through the fire, and the snow of smoke doesn't remain in us. We're not grumbling and complaining. We're taking it because we know it's Jesus that is taking it in me. And it's Jesus that is walking with me through this fire. We have too many complainers and not enough praisers in the house of God. And this is why we are facing what we are facing. Are you with me? Get praise back on your tongues. Get praise back in your hearts. 
your children are listening and you owe them to give them the very best of this life because God has given them to you as a gift and you to them as a gift. Are you listening? This isn't play play anymore. Many of our children, I want to say this, and I know some people don't like this, but we don't realize that many of our children are a meter away from house door. Many parents are doing nothing about it because they have no voice in their children's lives because their children has turned on them. And we need to stop addressing this like it's rebellion. And we need to start addressing this like it's the void of love. Check your family, check your own family today. Observe your own family today and ask yourself what love are they receiving? Are we buying them a gift and when they don't behave tomorrow we take the gift back? Do we threaten them with what we have given them? I would like to see God show up and come to us, Pastor Stephen. And say to me, you know that mantle I've given you from past year? You saw the way you didn't greet that person last week? I'm taking the mantle away. I'm taking the gift away. You're not worthy of receiving. And yet, as parents, we've been trained that this is how we discipline children. It's not. That's how you corrupt the child. It's not how you discipline a child, but a discipline is a way of discipline. We need to touch the father's heart. Hello. What good is it to try and discipline a 35 year old anyway, a 21 year old anyway? Hello. It says, form the tree, make it wimpy, form it while it's young. That doesn't mean beat the living crap out of it. Because that's what we've interpreted. It's true. Now, can we beat them? Absolutely, we should. Okay, but there's a way. There was two, two things created to receive a beating from God. It's right here. It's not over the head. And it's not words that destroy them. Hello? Come on, parents, I'm speaking to you this morning. Because some of us are operating like this. When we're angry at our kids, we start calling them names. And instead of speaking identity, listen, give the beating. Give what's necessary. But don't speak those names. You're people this, you're people that. Hello? Hey, who's raised in the house like that? We've all heard it. Because they saw it in their houses. Are you with me? And we've just become a product of who they were. We've become a product of somebody's dead uh, uh, relatives that never touched God, that never had a relationship with God. And yet we want to chain our children in the ways of our ancestors. Come on. The child needs to get a box slow or needs to be uh, disciplined in a way, then discipline that child, don't break that child. Don't cause the forces of hell to be loosed upon that child because of the words that you utter in a moment of anger and rage. That is not building, that is breaking. If you want to go, if you want to do yourself a favor, you go to any one of these kids, that are homeless on the streets. You, want to, you can go to any drug addict. You can go to any alcoholic. You can go to any person that is stuck, ravaged and destroyed by the world. And you sit with that person and you ask them, how was your home? And they'll tell you. They'll tell you, even those that were raised in rich homes, because we think this is about money, it isn't. Rich moms and dads just want to buy their children everything, but they're not touching them. There's no affection. There's no love. And they also end up on the streets. And I'm not saying this to invoke you in fear. We need to start addressing the truth. Satan has ripped the family unit apart. 
and we can complain about it, or we can take a stand and say, no more, no more. I'm calling my house to unity. And if your house isn't living with you anymore, then you pray them to unity. But if they're under your roof and you're not exercising godly authority, it's on you. It's not on your pastor, it's not on the evangelist, it's not on the prophet, it's not on the school that taught them, it's on us. Because they are a gift given to us, and all gifts are, gifts are supposed to multiply. Do we see multiplication on the lives of people that are homeless? No multiplication. So who's going to father this broken nation? Who's going to father this broken nation? I'm almost done. My next question to the men here, especially the men, this is relevant for some of the ladies as well, but especially to the men, I want to ask you, do you have a spiritual father? Do you have a person, a man, that is walking with God, speaking into your life, and fathering you, and building identity into your life. Uh, some natural dads will only go that far. God will connect you, of course, to Himself and to a spiritual father who is not a mentor. He is a person that is establishing your identity and the call of God over your life. And I know there's some things out there that's very manipulative. We're not talking about that stuff here. But there is a purity in the Word of God that we have to touch. Is it okay is if I'm very real with you this morning? Is that okay? I'm not preaching, I'm speaking. But I believe that I'm speaking from a place where my heart is still anchored to the Word. Now, parent, father, and mother understand that God's goodness will always lead us to repentance. And if we realize and recognize in our own lives, that we have maybe missed it. All we have to do is we have to turn to our Father. Say, Lord, forgive me. I've been raising my child wrong. Or I've been doing something that I know is not in line with what God will. And then that's not your children's right to go, yeah, when you said this. No, God forgave me. It's done. It's over. Children, we can do the very same thing with our parents. I'm being very real. Being very real. <coughs> See, God wants the family unit to be strong. He doesn't break us with business. He doesn't break us with finances. Those things are just extra. If He breaks us in our homes, He's got a very firm grip on us. Are you with me? Is that okay? Can you say that we can say, I will? I will. See, see the face of God, face of God. To, know him, to know Him, to understand Him, to, understand him. to behold Him, that I will become the blueprint of God's love on this earth, on this earth. in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. 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 All right, so um, the past couple of weeks, for those, by the way, uh, for whatever reason, you cannot make it to power group. I want to encourage you to please come. If you need transport, speak. If you have a need, speak. But don't miss it. Power group is, as it says, it's the power of the life of a church. Here we teach, but there we flow and we move. And so the last couple of weeks, um, the Lord had laid it on our heart because we church has a function in this town. Amen. Rechurch has a role to play. And if those that are sitting amongst us are not growing, then what are we doing? Hallelujah. So can you please come forward and uh, teach Kiara? Um, we believe that God wants to use Kiara in a, in a way of, of teaching. I'm going to help you there now. And so the past couple of weeks, I've been stretching Kiara a bit. Amen. Especially in power group. Hey, Kiara, do you feel stretching? <laughs> All right, but we're doing this so that what's inside of Kiara 
will come out to the benefit of the body. Are you with me? And so those that have been attending power group who've been praying with her and into her life, and I'm sure you've received some messages, I hope, that you have of encouragement as well. And so I'm giving these opportunities, guys, because church is you. Church is not me standing there talking all the time. So I want us this morning, because you know that I have instituted this. So the way that you would receive me is the way you receive Christ. You know the word of God says that? So if we receive Jesus and you receive me, I now want you to receive Kiara. Can we give her a hand of applause? teach us this morning, I encourage you to take out your notebook, I encourage you to take out your Bible, um, and um, as you take it out, she's just going to lead us, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Stephen to please come to the front, alright, got it there, good, so I want you just to pray for us. Just open the meeting and the time of the word, and then we can all stretch our hands out to Kiara as well. So I haven't ordained her yet, but you're going to start hearing, I'm going to start calling her teacher. I'm going to start calling her teacher. Why? Because I'm prophetically affirming what's over her life. I'm not giving her a title, I'm giving her a function. There's a difference. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, today, thank you for the word. I just want to be released right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the teaching. I pray for the listening here that, Lord, you might touch the ear that people may understand and know you know your word. Father, may your passion of you, Lord Jesus, may be revealed in your word this morning. Father, we see the glory. We see the honor. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, 
and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle day by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Mm. Okay, so God gave Moses a specific pattern or template of how he wanted things to be set up yes. in the tabernacle. Okay, we can see, mm. um, so this is the altar of sacrifice. And uh, you can see it in the shape of a cross, right? Mm. So the table, the, the altar of sacrifice, um, this is just also another um, setup of, of how it was. So we'll see on the, the table at the altar of sacrifice, it's first atonement. You see number one here, it says atonement. Yes. Yes. Then you enter, mm. then it's holiness. Prayer, access, fellowship, and then eternal life. Wow. So there was a process um, to get to the Holy of Holies. Yes, that's good. Um, all right, just the interesting fact is the, the materials used to make the furniture. So the um, altar of sacrifice is made out of acacia wood, and a lot of the other furniture was as well. Um, acacia wood um, it has deep roots and it can thrive in dry ground. Um, Isaiah 53 verse 2, um, if somebody could just read that. Can you grab it for us, Stephen? Isaiah what? 53? 53 verse 2. Who else has got some Bible? Can you help me out? My phone is probably recording the meeting. Okay, Isaiah 53 2. Yeah, right. It says, um, Isaiah 53 2, it says, no. For the servant of God grew up before him like a tender plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, royal kind uh, uh, king in form, but we should do a you and no beauty that we should desire. Mm. Okay, so that's A and B seems unattractive. Mm. Uh, and then um, the Septuagint which is the, the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, right? Um, translated acacia as aptatos, you can say that right, I hope I am, which means incorruptible. Mm. The Christ is our incorruptible seed, right? Yes, it's good. Um, I'm just going to read that quickly. Let me see, let me see, 26. Thank you, Tom, man. Thank you, Tom. It's good. <laughs> Hebrews 7 26 says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Mm. Okay. We all know this one, John Hebrews 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, so that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. So if you look at the altar of sacrifice again, um, it's in a shape of a square, right? It's a cube. Yeah. Which basically, if you look at it, it's like the four corners of the world. Okay. So God died for the whole world. Wow. Okay. And then, um, let's get to 1 John 1, verse 7 to 9. So okay, help them. On John 1 verse 7. So if we walk in the light, we no. live in the light, we exist for one another, and the Lord Jesus Christ, His Son, takes us from all sin. If we say that in a sin, we receive ourselves and the truth not in us. If we confess our sin, we are faithful and just to be sure that we are fully dependent on all unrighteousness. So that again, with the, um, the altar of sacrifice, Jesus is our sacrifice. Um, you'll notice, um, just go back to that, um, that picture there. 
Um, you see these like horns on the corners of the of the altar. Mm -hmm. So they basically use those horns for um, tying the animal down. Wow. And um, horns in the Bible is also meaning um, it's like strength, yes. power, oh. glory. Yes. Right? So Jesus is, is our strength. Yes. And if you read in the Psalms 82, he said, Horn of our salvation. Yes. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. Um, so, let's actually get a picture of, of the altar of sacrifice. Uh, if we can get to Exodus 27, verse 1 to 8, so we can just read that. Exodus 27, 1 to 8, it says, And make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits square and three cubits high, within reach of all. Make homes for it on its four corners. They shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Three, you shall make pots to take away its ashes and shovels, basins, forks, and fire pans. Make all its utensils of bronze. For also make for it great a network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings, and its four corners five, and you shall put it under the ledge of the altar, so that the net will extend halfway down the altar. Six, and make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood overlaid with bronze. Seven, the poles shall be put through the rings on the sides of the altar, with which to carry it. Eight, you shall make the altar hollow with slabs or planks, as shown you on the mountain, so you shall eat the mm -hmm. okay, So this is where the animals, unblemished animals, goats and lambs and goats were sacrificed. Yeah. If you read in Leviticus 17 verse, uh, 17 verse 11, sorry, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, yes. and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Oh. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Yes. Okay. I just want to start there. <laughs> okay. So, just a quick point as well. We see that the altar of sacrifice is the first like element before you reach the uh, into the, the tabernacle. Um, the reason for that is because judgment and sin must be dealt with first before we can enter wow. into That's God's good. presence. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then obviously the labor of washing is the second element. Um, Exodus 30 verse 18 to 21. So let me just read it. It's past Stephen again. <laughs> Exodus 19. Exodus 13, 18, 1. Um, you shall also make a lever or large basin of bronze, and its base of bronze, for washing, and you shall put it outside in the court, between the tent of meeting and the altar of burnt offering, and you shall put water in it. 19. They, Aaron and his sons, shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord. 21. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. It shall be a perpetual statute for Aaron and his descendants throughout the generations. Thank you. Okay, so as we said, God forgives first and then he gives power to live clean unto him. Come on, He's not telling us to be clean first. Yes, okay. come on. Right, the holy place, this is the first sanctuary where we have the golden lampstand, the golden lay of the filler, the golden table of showbread, and the golden altar of incense. Right, 
So the global life central logics that there's like seven uh, candle stick things. Okay, so if you look at the, in the middle, it's like a branch. So that's the main branch. And yes. out of all of those comes the six on each side. Yes. Okay, so if you look at it, Jesus is our branch, we are the vines, right? Um, and it says in um, John 1 verse 1 to 4, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so you can just see that we are, we are attached to that branch. If you look at the seven, um, it's, it's God um, in his perfection yes. and um, in his completeness. Yes. And then six is obviously the, the number of man. Yes. Okay. All right, so there's the um, verse, Christ is the light and the life. Okay, John 1, verse 1 to 3. Right, then we've got the golden table of showbread. So it's interesting to note that there was once a week 12 loaves had to be set out on the table and those loaves would remain on that table for the week. Okay. On the Sabbath, the priests, the priests could then eat that bread. So um, as we say, that's God and man who shared the same table because God, it was for God in the week and then on the Sabbath in the priest wow. so That's they good. were communing with each other. Okay, it's communion. Um, another interesting fact is that there was 12 um, loaves, there was 12 tribes of Judah, yes. there was 12 disciples. Yes. And when Jesus, um, when he had when he gave communion with his disciples, and when he had communion with his disciples, he had 12 loaves, or 12 pieces that he gave them. Amen. Okay. Amen. Alright, um, John 6 verse 51 says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Sure. And if you look at just the um, cup of blessing in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16 to 21, um, it says, The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participant? in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is like one bread, we who are many are one body. Mm. We all partake of the one bread. Mm. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices, participants in the altar. What do I imply then? The food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be the participants of the demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Mm. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Okay, so we just see that this that they are speaking in a communion with God. Table Golden Altar he says um, Psalm 141 verse 2 Psalms Psalms 41 verse 1 Psalms 141 verse 2 It says, Lord, I call upon you Master to me, give ear to my voice when I cry to you let my prayer be set forth as essence before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Amen. So the incense was burning day and night. Mm. Okay. And if you look at it, it's as if it's the, the prayers yeah. being released. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Yeah. Um, Revelation 5 verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp 
and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Come on. And in Revelation 8, verse 3, says, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Then we get to the holiest of holies, which is the second sanctuary, and it contained the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. Um, Exodus 25, verse 22. So it's interesting to know that nobody could pass that the way of right. Yes. Um, and it says here, There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from to it. From between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Okay, so this was the holiest of holies. Um, you will see there. So the the ark of the covenant is actually two pieces, which is the, the bottom part, which is the ark, and then the CC was the second piece. Yeah. Okay. Um, the angels also represent like protection um, over God's covenant um, with Israel. Um, okay, there is the sorry. Um, okay. So the contents of the Ark of the Covenant is the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, which is God's righteousness. Yes. Um, before us. Then there was a golden pot of manna, which was God's provision. Yes. Okay, and then Aaron's right at Bible with life. Um, we can think of it as Jesus being um, the life. Yes. Um, the way that you the life. Um, so yeah, that was that was all in the in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, um, Psalm 40 verse 6 to 10 says, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, for your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. And in Hebrews 4.14, um, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Yes. It's <laughs> uh, just a the mercy seat. Um, okay, so Romans, um, Romans 3, verse 21 to 25. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. For though the law and the prophets be witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over for his sins. Okay, and then Hebrews 9, 12. He entered once for all into the holy place, places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And he um, Jesus is God's mercy seat. Amen. Okay. Within the tabernacle, Jesus represented the altar, the sacrifice, and the high priest. Sure. Okay. 
Okay, and then just the interesting fact um, the tabernacle was, as I said earlier, on, constructed according to a pattern. Um, the Hebrew word pattern is, sorry, the Hebrew word for pattern is tabni, tabni is pronounced that way, yeah. which means form, likeness, figure, or plan, replica, okay? And then it has an action or a verbal root, which is bana, and the root word of that is sana. Beautiful. So yeah. we can see that everything points to Jesus. Mm. Sure, that's mm. stunning. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Come on, let's see Jesus. That's good. That's very good. You see, we don't have to receive teachers as pastors. We don't have to receive pastors as prophets. Uh, very few of you even know and understand of some of the gifts that are in your midst. And so just keep praying. I want to quickly highlight something here that is so beautiful and part of uh, thank you, teaching care of your obedience. Uh, Pastor Stephen, can you go to Revelation 5 verse 8 quickly? Revelation 5 verse 8. We draw it to a close. Okay. Revelation 5 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders of the heavenly, so he prostrated themselves before the Lamb. Each was holding a cup, a flute, or a guitar. And they had golden bowls full of incense, fragrant spices, and garments for burning, which are the prayers of the Lord's people, he says. Okay. These golden bowls that the angels are holding in the presence of God Almighty. Right this moment, understanding that this didn't happen in the tabernacle, like DJ Kiara said, the tabernacle is a replica of how the system, the, the prophetic and the spiritual system of heaven works. God just put it into a natural form for us so that we and the Israelites, now we in Christ, we are forever in the Holy of Holies. Do you remember? Where's the Holy of Holies? Check this. Go through the notes here. Yeah? You see, you've got a lot of notes, eh? Okay, so check this. Check how far that is from the Holy of Holies. So everything here is the flesh, right? That's why I said earlier, a lot of prayers are being offered here. And so they're not being answered. Because prayers are not offered here. Hello? <laughs> prayers are offered here. Are you with me? I don't sacrifice anymore. Jesus became the sacrifice. But if I'm continually living in religion, religion will cause me to want to sacrifice over and over, and as a result, those prayers don't reach heaven. Now, check what happens to the prayers when they reach heaven. Do you know that all prayers don't reach heaven? No, it's, all prayers do not reach heaven. Prayers rooted in religion, prayers outside of the word, prayers for self, prayers, prayers, prayers in self, do not reach heaven. It's as good as speaking to the wall. And that's how often it feels that way because we're standing in the wrong place. Yeah. Are you with me? I still want to sacrifice. I want to be the sacrifice. It's on me. The blood of Jesus wasn't enough. No, he came once and for all, for all the elements, so that you and I will be in the Holy of Holies. And when I operate from the Holy of Holies, this means, like I just told you earlier, this is about your identity. Are you with me? You stand before, you stand as a son before God and you speak from that place as a son. Your prayers are heard. But check this, your prayers are connected in golden bowls that the angels hold. Check their posture. And they go down. Did you just read it? And they lie prostrate. I can't do that now because you're going to see my bum bum. Okay, but anyway. And they lie prostrate before the Lord. And they worship before God. And God can smell the incense of His people. Are you with me? And then what does He do? He sends the angels back. 
with the answer. And the fire comes and it burns on the mercy seat of our lives. You see in the Old Testament how the mercy seat was covered with two angels? It means it's because the prayer went up with angels. The prayer comes down with angels. Are you with me? Come on now. It's not just here in the sky. It's being received by the angels of God. And it's burning like an incense. Even now, at this very moment, as I'm speaking to you, this is what's happening in heaven 24-7. Amen? So thank you for reminding us and showing us again. We're not stuck in the Old Testament. We're not even stuck in that tabernacle. We now have become the tabernacle and the place of meeting. We've become the Holy of Holies from where which God answers and hears our prayers. Are you with me? I'm not saying that God doesn't answer some of the wacky prayers, some of those prayers because there's grace. He answers. But when we get His Word, He measures according to His Word. Understand that God is a God of order. The order never changes. New Testament did not change the order of God. There's a way God receives, there's a way God does. Now He does it by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Is that good? Thank you. That was very good. That was awesome. I'm sure we all heard something. Can those that are on the communion table just quickly get that ready for us? It will be so kind. And then Pastor Stephen, if you can just come and deliver your message, that would be good. Let me tell you what he's expecting. He's expecting obedience. 
Mm. It's respecting okay. obedience. That's that's it. It's obedience. It's all about obedience. Love serves, nourishes. Love it multiplies. Love it upgrades the neighbor. When you love your neighbor, you give your neighbor something. Yes. You cannot just say, I love you. Yeah. But the word of God says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes, come so, on. meaning, if you, if you don't walk in love with your God, love and giving, they go in hand in hand. So, meaning, if you are full of love, you are the ultimate giver. Yes. In everything that you do, you just give. When you see people, you just give. Love defends, it covers sins, it protects. If you love your neighbor, you protect him. It's part, all in all, in giving. I have to give my attention to this person or to these people. I have to give attention. Love and giving. It depends on the type of giving you're giving. You're giving time. Someone needs your time. Someone needs just to hear you talk. Talk to me. Give me attention. I need it. Are you giving that? Are you giving your money? Are you giving your time? Mm. Yeah, man. Robbing God. Malaga can tell. Hmm. I wanna show you what type does. I'm sure I've spoken about this one. Malaga three ten. Let me go there quickly. Malaga three ten. Malaga three ten. It says, "Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house." And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be a room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Let me show you what tithe does. Tithe was meant for obedience. That's all. Do you obey God and love? If you love your God, you obey Him. And when we obey him, we tithe. Tithe it. God doesn't want your tithe. God doesn't want your money. <laughs> he is the money in himself. I mean, there is gold in heaven. Angels walk on the streets of gold. But God says, you robbed me. Why does he say you have robbed me? God saying you have robbed me in your tithes and your offering. Because that is the same thing that he wants to use to give you so that it can multiply. God has created already. He can't create anymore because he's created. Give me what you have. God is a God of multiplication. You know what Jesus did when he fed the, the 10,000 and the 5,000? What did he do? Two fishes and five pounds of bread. He blessed that and he multiplied. He's a God of multiplication. And I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that you will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. That's what he does. Right. What activates uh, overflow in your life? It is not the time, it is the giving. Yes. It's not the it is the giving. The giving is what brings overflow in your life. Let me let me ponder more on this one on the giving part here. Yeah. Do you know God is fair and just? What you sow is what you reap. So if you if you if you if you sow anger, if you if you sow depression and forgiveness, you will reap that. It will follow you all over you go. But if you give your money, it will return to you in form of money. You know, people have this thing to say, let me just give money. So it will return to me in form of a failure. No, it doesn't work that way. I've given 10,000. I will expect money to come to me. And money is a good thing. When you need Ecclesiastes 1019, I'm not going to be talking about that. Money is a good thing. Money is not evil. Money is good, but it says the love of money is the root to all evil. I myself, 
standing before you. I like money, but I don't love it. I like it. Why? Because it is the answer to all things. Because that's what the word of God says in Ecclesiastes 19. Money is the answer of everything. It makes the world go round. Stay in the Bible. So money is good. We all have money sitting here. But what are we doing with our money? We don't preach money to say, bring money, money, money for you to get a blessing. Money, money. Ah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, go and sow seed and receive. If you can go and give a car, you will get a car. If you want to give, like, I want to share a, a testimony on giving. That was some time back. I was trusting God for a, a wife. I met a couple that was getting married. I went to them and said, you're getting married. I want to sow the seed. I saw the seed in that I called it marriage. And God opened the door for me in that area. Business, then vanilla tech, uh, many times there I can talk and talk about it. Lord, this is all that I have. I want to type, I want to give this amount of money. I'm trusting God for one, two, three, four contracts. Exactly what I've been trusting God, it happens because I've sown a seed. You can't reap what you've not harvested. It's a kingdom principle. The last one I want to share. I want to share. The dangers of not observing the offering in your tithes. That is Malachi 1 6 to 14. I want you to listen to carefully on this word here. Yeah. It's Malachi 1 6 to 14. Right. These are the dangers when you give. If you notice when you give, you like, ah, it's just a duty. You don't give out of duty, by the way. Never, ever, ever give out of duty. It will become a curse. Yep. Many of us, we are walking in lead because we have just given. Because it's, it's a duty. I'm obliged to give. Don't do it. It will, it will curse your finances. When I have money, when a basket has been presented before, you just dip your hand in your pocket, you don't even think about it, you don't, you don't give your seed a name, you just take it out, you just throw it in there. You will get a curse out of that. If you don't have a revelation of giving, not even give, because there are repercussions of that. Let me read for you the repercussions of that. <laughs> a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reference? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Meaning you can take a and when you offer the blind a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Will he accept you favorably? Meaning, when you are giving, give your best. And when you give your best, may God not say, but he's just putting a thing in there and this, this, this. There's no word in it, you know? Let me tell you something. When you are putting money in there, there is the kingdom of light. What should you be putting your money in there and there's the kingdom of darkness? Are you honoring that? I'm telling you, they, they watch. God gives you the seed. So he's eaten the seed. But there's one who's faithful in the times and offering. They are angels, they go back to God. They thought, no, he gave. How much did he give? Oh, he gave his 5,000. But he was supposed to tithe 500. Why did he give 5,000? I don't know, maybe he wants more. And God rewards you in that and giving because God sees the heart at the end of the day. Nine. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. Well, this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of us. Who is there even among you who will shut the doors 
so that you will not kind of fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, will I accept an offering from your hands? For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name, and the pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say, the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit is food and is fruitable. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen. You don't go and steal and say, oh, and give to the Lord. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. You don't give what is best to God. You, don't, you give out of obligation. You give because it's a duty. You don't do that. Listen what, what happens. And you bring the stolen, the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Thus says the Lord. You give what is best to the Lord. If you don't have what you give, don't give. But if you know this is the best that I have, in your conscious and your subconscious, knowing this is my best, give, and you shall receive a reward. There is one thing for the past in closing. I was like, Lord, there are so many things that I'm lacking in. So many. There's so much that I need to do. But you know what? The answer that I got from God give me. One answer, I'm expecting a revelation, a prophecy, where I'm going to get a good deal, where I'm going to sell my stuff, get money. But God gives you one answer give. You give. What should I give? Give. That is the secret and the doorway for us to prosper as a church, as a family, as businesses, giving. I believe you should have a time of giving as a church. Spend time. Let me share something. I remember the old building. Every Sunday after church, we would cook the people that would come in cook and, and we go to the streets and we distribute. I remember we used to do that. Pastor Klaus, oh, Amanda, uh, Dorothy, and Christine. We used to go give, but we see the wonders of the Lord. By giving, people come giving. When we get our salaries or when we get our wages, do this. Take at least 250 rand, take 500 rand, take it aside, go out in the street. I want you to practice this, at least for the next seven months or so, you'll see our lives will transform. Buy something, someone say, look, I am buying this food. Buy food, shoes, whatever, a, a coat, a blanket, whatever. My brother, I love you. My sister, I love you. Here you go. Give you. That on its own, it will increase our economy as a house, as families, and as businesses through giving. Businesses, all, God showed me this, all businesses that have a department that goes in the street to serve their, their prosperity. And most of those businesses are Muslims. Muslims, every month, they sacrifice food time and money to the streets. They never go hungry, but they don't know what give you. Businesses that don't go out, they give poor. You work, you work, you work, you don't even see where your money is going to. Because there's no giving. Thank you. All right, let's stand up. And uh, I'm going to ask the, the last rows, the last two rows, quickly to come. Give your seat, take your bread and your wine. Just turn back to your chair quickly. We just want to wrap this up. So take the word that Pastor Stephen is sharing with you this morning, that Kiara shared this morning, and even myself. 
It's been three unique things that have come from this platform this morning for you to hear and to become. That's why we hear the Word of God, because our faith increases. So God bless you in your giving. Just go back to your seat. I'm just going to put something on for you. I want you to listen to what has been shared with you this morning. And then you may go home one day. We're not going to pray over that communion. We've already prayed. God is already in our midst. So just seal the deal. Whoever you received, you will know what you received this morning. Tie what you received to your spirit by partaking of the life and bread of life and the blood that was shed for you. If you need healing, you are taking the symbol to that healing right now. You are ingesting Jesus.